Now into the ticket office of Disneyland. <laughs> oh boy, let's do this. <laughs> I don't think the CIA is going to be trying to hack your second gen iPod. I didn't think so. There might have been a lot of illegal music on there. I wouldn't <laughs> doubt it. But, I mean. You were supposed to bring death to the flagships, not join them. Google has found a new way to piss me off. iTunes is a constant source of embarrassment. <laughs> Behind the scenes camera crap. May I present to you the cat? I am the doll. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't do it anymore without laughing. I was going to do the whole thing. Welcome, everyone, to the Calling All Platforms podcast. I am your host, Wes, and I am here with Landon. Hello. And we do not have Caleb today. (laughs) At least not in his uh, usual form. Yeah, not in his usual form, actually. Uh, So, listener, life happens. Life happens where you're not able to be at a podcast. You got to do stuff with family, which, fair enough. Yeah. You got to do that. But... You know, I can't blame him, but it doesn't mean I'm not mad at him. <laughs> but I mean, it's the perfect it's the perfect time to leave when it's you know he's our Apple guy, and they just had an event. Yeah. <sighs> WWDC so, you know. was today, and of course, you know he's got to be gone. <laughs> he's got to be gone. So, but don't worry, listener. We uh, we did some magic tricks. We we had him go ahead and record his thoughts and feelings throughout the event. Or what he thought of the event. And uh, so what we're going to do, I think we actually did this once or twice before where he would record his reactions and then we would talk, we would play it and then we talk about it. Yeah. And so we're going to do the same type of format here and uh, talk about the event and what we think, what we feel on all sorts of things. Uh, we both now I so I watched two different things. So I watched like, a you know, the WWDC keynote in. 18 minutes in one place and then 12 minutes in another. And it kind of summed up different features and things. So that's kind of how I watched it. I think Caleb said he watched the whole thing. <laughs> did, yeah, so did you watch the life. whole thing? I did watch the whole thing periodically throughout the day, whenever I could find a couple minutes here and there to do it. But yes, so I do have thoughts on it. And yeah. yeah. So, so this is what we're going to do. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to play. Uh, the recording of Caleb, we're going to stop at certain stopping points. So we can kind of talk about it and um, go from there. So and, until the very end, and that's going to be our episode for today. So, all right, Landon, go ahead and start it up. All righty. My apologies, listener, to not being able to record live with the guys this week. Summer schedules are hard, and this is a symptom of that but I know that you'll be missing out on a ridiculous number of rants because of this, which I do regret. I'll be sure to make it up to you in the coming weeks. And yes, we can guarantee that there will be rants. Just, I mean, (laughs) listener, (laughs) we've already listened to this and we've got certain points that are going to, like Wes said, we're going to stop and give our comments, but there are times where you will hear the disgust in Caleb's voice. And <laughs> yes, where will. where there would have, if he were here, would have been a rant in those scenarios. But we will get those at a later date, and we will all enjoy them because we always do. We always love always. a good rant from Spendlove. True. Now let's see if we can't summarize this event in a tenth the time that Apple spent on it. This WWDC started out with a skit, as per usual, which literally features the presenters jumping out of Air Force One and skydiving down to the Apple Park. Craig's helmet was excellent, but this honestly might fall behind Craig's parkour transition from iPadOS to macOS in terms of overall coolness. <laughs> now, listener, so if you haven't by chance watched the event or watched even just the intro, go watch the intro because it is fantastic. So like Caleb said, they're all in an airplane, like it's got Apple's original colors painted on it and different things and Greg Federighi's up there and he's getting everyone hyped up for it. And then all of a sudden, uh, Phil, what's his last name? Phil Schiller. He's driving the plane and he like, Greg looks over at him and he says, okay, it's time. And then Phil's like, oh, I'm getting too old for this. Then he looks over at an original iPod, starts playing Motley Crue on it. Yeah. And then it turns (laughs) back around and all the Apple people that are there, including Craig, are in these big jump shoots, like they're ready to go skydiving, basically jump out of the plane. Yeah. 
and they're decorated like it's mostly white jumpsuits with the original apple colors and different things on them. Pretty cool look. And then they all put on helmets. Everyone jumps out as everyone else is jumping out. Craig, you know, Hair Force One, as he's called, because he's got the best hair at Apple by far. He puts on a helmet that matches his hair. <laughs> and it's fantastic. <laughs> yes. And then the other it part that Caleb funny. is alluding to is going in between iOS and iPad OS. He does. Well, I don't, I'm, I'm sure it's not him. But a stunt double, probably, that looks an awful lot like him and similar hair, is jumping like between stairs, doing a bunch of parkour moves and stuff to a different level of Apple Park, and then going to a, a different operating system to talk about it. So it was pretty great, I thought, anyways. It was pretty it was pretty funny. I mean definitely a, a different take on a keynote for some of this. So. Well, it's funny because like the first thing I thought of when I saw it when it I started watching, I was like, are they just trying to copy what Google did if like when because when Google announced uh google glass they actually had somebody skydive and live stream from a google glass his descent oh that's on, right they onto did. the building where they did the presentation and then somebody else on with google glass went on a motorcycle into the thing and it was like a whole yeah. big deal so that's what i initially thought of this was a little different than that but it was still pretty good yeah i agree no it was it was uh it was pretty cool to, to, to watch. It was funny because in the, the things I watched, I didn't see that. So when we first listened to this, uh, he made that comment. And I, I kind of was confused. And, and uh, Landon was like, here, let me show you what this is. So <laughs> yeah. I watched it. I, I was pretty amused. It was pretty funny. So They did talk about Apple TV Plus up front and showed a bunch of trailers for new shows and new seasons of popular shows like Silo and Severance. My takeaway is that they now seem to have a show or movie featuring just about every single Hollywood A-lister of, like, the past 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, and, like, the one that caught my eye was basically a... I don't know exactly. They didn't show a full preview of this movie, obviously. I don't even know what it was called. But it lo- it reminded me of like an Ocean's Eleven or Ocean, you know, the Ocean's movies because oh. it had George Clooney and Brad Pitt in it. I'm like, okay, I might have to watch that because it's George Clooney and Brad Pitt. You know, you gotta watch. Yeah, it. I li- I do like that one. Moving on from there, they started out talking about their operating systems with Vision OS two. Vision OS two feels like the second beta release for this product as opposed to an actual product release. But they are adding some new gestures. The ability to convert normal photos to 3D and Mac virtual display is going to support ultra wide displays later this year. Also, apparently they've got Canon making a lens specifically for recording spatial videos. Overall, it kind of seems like they're still trying to figure out how to justify people buying this thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can agree with that. Yeah. I will say, though, I did. I did like the idea, like, so you can mirror your desktop or your laptop, you know, in Vision OS and have it yeah. make a bigger monitor. I do like the idea that they're making it, like, it, it, they, the way they put it is basically two 4K monitors, but, like, it's one giant wraparound display type thing. Yep. And I know a lot of people that use Vision OS for that purpose have been asking for that. So I like that they're doing that, and it was really cool. And I do, I am interested to see how people utilize this new Canon lens that you can shoot spatial video with. I mean, you you can do it on an iPhone pro device that has the three cameras and stuff, but I'm, I'm very curious to see how people use this Canon camera lens to get, but I mean, basically higher quality video from because it's an actual DSLR versus an iPhone. Right. So I'm curious to see how that goes. And, and I mean, the benefit to that is, you can also just use that as your regular camera and then just put the video up normally. But then if people are watching on Vision OS, they can have the spatial video or whatever. It's interesting. It is. I think I think it's pretty cool. Like I said, an excuse for someone to buy, <laughs> to buy one. <laughs> yeah. Moving on to iOS, iOS 18 is going to be bringing additional levels of OS customization, allowing you to finally free place app icons and widgets on the home screen instead of just having them locked to the top left corner. Finally! (laughs) (laughs) I was wondering if you were going to comment on that. I mean, it's 
we'll it, he'll get into this more and we'll get into this more but it's basically the androidification of ios more or less yeah it's like yeah the i mean the widgets was the first thing and now the fact that you can basically put any app icon anywhere and the way they they like talked about it was you've got this great background that you know they showed a picture it was like a picture of the guy's dog he's like you got this great picture as your background but then when you open it up on the home screen all your app icons are covering it but now you can move your app icons around to showcase the same picture i'm like well yeah that's been the thing on android since the very beginning (laughs) come on why did yeah why did it take so long to do this because they now can say apple intelligence well i mean that didn't it this is a lack Precursor. of Apple intelligence, in my opinion. <laughs> the home screen will now support dark mode, as well as automatic recoloring, so you can stop using that ridiculous shortcuts workaround to actually have thematically unified app icons. This one also is a really cool feature, but it's interesting because like, I use dark mode almost exclusively on my devices, and it does, like, especially folders in particular, like it does show them on the home screen a little bit darker than if you were in light mode, but this, the way it showed, it makes it almost more drastic, I guess. And then the ability to basically change the color <clears throat> of any app icon, they have like a, 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 like you can choose the color. Like it'll offer you a, a color based on your background. So it'll kind of match, but all yeah. the app icons, go on that little theme it's very similar to what android has been doing the last couple of years with the oh what do they call it and can't remember what they call it now uh well but it's basically like theming your whole system on your phone to how you want it to be and android has done it to where like it'll theme around your wallpaper if you want it to or you can choose like it's basically the same thing that what Android has done for now a couple of years, but it's nice that they're finally doing things like this to make your phone your phone. Very nice. Yeah. Control Center is getting a big update, supporting multiple control screens, adding gallery for browsing controls that can be added to the control center, and an API for devs to add controls for their apps. Lock screen controls, also known as the camera and flashlight buttons can now also be swapped out. iOS privacy has been improved for situations where actual hardware access exists, like if you hand your phone to someone so they can make a call or watch a video. Apps can now be set to be locked, requiring re-authentication to open them, or even hidden, which will put them into a locked and obscured folder in the app drawer. You'll also have more control over how apps access your contacts, connected devices, and other hardware details. I do like this, the ability to basically lock your phone into one app because there are times where, I mean, most of the time for me, it's when I hand my phone over to my kids. I don't like, they want to look at pictures or something and say, okay, you can look at pictures, but I don't want you to do anything else. And sometimes they'll just magically show up in some other app. Like, no, that's not what you're supposed to do. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But it's also nice, like if you're giving your phone like say you want some if you're at a location you want someone to take a picture for you you can lock it in the camera so they can't get out of there with your phone you know yeah. so that is kind of nice things like this i think are definite benefits and i and like i i i think you can do something similar on android but i can't remember for sure but more privacy and more things like this is always a good feature yeah i I do agree with that. I think it's pretty cool. And they set it up to where it'll, then they say it would, when they lock it, it's face ID. You can have the different types to unlock it too. Face what, ID. But... Yeah. Like if you were to try, if someone were to try and switch, like go to your home screen or go to a different app, it requires you to unlock the, the phone, yeah. whether you're using face ID or your, your passcode or something like that. It requires that. So they can't just automatically switch to a different app on without you knowing. Right. Messages has also been updated with features you're probably already used to in WhatsApp. Tapbacks can now be any emoji or sticker, and you can alter the text formatting and add text effects to the contents of your messages. 
You can also use satellite connectivity on certain iPhone models to send messages or texts, and you can schedule messages now, which honestly, how has it taken this long for that to be a feature? (laughs) You know, it's funny because I didn't know that scheduling messages was a thing on other phones and platforms and or different apps and whatnot because like it would it's never been a thing in google messages like just the built-in i always use the default messaging app for most things in general same so it's like i didn't like i heard about it on a samsung phone like the default messages app on samsung for a lot of years has been able to do that i didn't learn about that till a few years ago it's like and ever since then i've really wanted it (laughs) and (laughs) finally it's here on just built into the iMessages app, which is great. Now, I want Google to do that on Google Messages, but I don't know when that's going to happen. Maybe next year at I.O. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there, it'll be soon because once one starts doing one, the other one follows. Yeah, but pretty much. A lot of these type usability features do tend to jump back and forth between operating systems. But yeah. I, I like that. I also, like Caleb said, the, so the tap back feature, that's basically like a a reaction to an individual message within the messages app. I, I like, I do use that feature on a fairly regular basis. Like right now there's five different options you can choose from. There's like a, a thumbs up, a heart, a thumbs down, a exclamation point reaction, a ha ha reaction, or a question mark. And they're, they're not, I mean, they're not emoji. They're just kind of basic, right? But after this update, you'll be able to react with any emoji and it'll show in the style of what the emoji is. And yeah, I like that. I mean, like I said, I do use that on a fairly regular basis. So I like the ability to expand how you want to react to a message. It's always, always nice. It was funny. I, uh, (laughs) so I think we talked about this while ago. Like I don't use a lot of, these features and i find out obviously when stuff like this comes up so i i was just messing before we recorded to see if android has some of these and i was showing i was like oh yeah i can do all this this is actually kind of cool look (laughs) i have a bajillion of these emojis so it's so funny so yeah apparently android can do it on there and they had another like photo emoji thing on there too but yeah i guess that's uh there you go so i also learned things too to just to fun because then i'm like wait can i do this oh yes i can or oh no i can't <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like oh it's so bad sometimes with the mobile phone stuff me yeah. i'm like i got lol and that's as far as i got sometimes <laughs> i feel now there is one thing that caleb doesn't mention and it was not mentioned in the keynote but i did see this somewhere i just read a headline i didn't actually read the article about it because i didn't have time today but yeah I did see that Apple has confirmed RCS is coming to messages sometime. Again, I didn't read the article to know when or if it's part of iOS 18 or if it's going to be updated in the summer. I don't know. But they did mention that RCS is coming at some point. So that's a good thing. So we won't have the, I mean, there's still going to be the green bubble situation, I'm sure. But they will be bringing RCS so they will have better pictures across devices, better reactions across devices, just making it better for both iOS and Android users talking to each other. And that's always a good thing. Yes, it is. Now you don't have to buy your mom an iPhone, like Tim mentioned a while ago. (laughs) There you go. There was also a slew of minor updates to some of the built-in apps. Mail is basically adding Google's multiple inbox sorting thing. Maps is adding hiking and other trail map data. And Wallet is adding a tap to share feature for transferring Apple Cash between devices without having to exchange phone numbers or anything like that. That feature I thought was really cool. So the way it works is basically like how last year they updated AirDrop to where you can just hold two phones, the tops of the two phones together, and it can you can start an AirDrop thing that way instead of just, you know, going through and clicking the different things to find airdrop and whatnot. So it works the same way where you hold the two phones together and you can share, like you can send money to that person, basically the same way you would do with Venmo or Zelle, or even inside of Apple wallet. You can do that as well, but this just makes it a little bit easier to pay somebody a little, a little faster, more or less. And I kind of like that feature. 
It is any anything that, like you said, don't have to have the phone number just here. There's the money. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Much good, easier. good. Journal is adding a bunch of stuff that, frankly, I'm amazed wasn't already there, like the ability to search entries. And they're adding a game mode to iOS to reduce background activity and lower Bluetooth latency for controllers and headphones while you're gaming. Also, they've redesigned the whole Photos app to make it more, quote-unquote, usable, which basically means you're going to have to get used to an entirely new way of using Photos later this year for, honestly, very little benefit. It's prettier, I guess. And, uh, so this whole time when they were doing the whole photo, like the new photos app and stuff, I just watch them like, I don't fully understand what you're doing inside of there. That's a neat feature. I personally, I don't usually use Apple, like the photos app on my phone. I use Google photos for everything. Like, cause it automatically backs up for me inside of Google photos. So like, I just automatically myself go into Google Photos and that's how I view photos. I don't use the default photos app on my iPhone. So maybe I'll go into the new photos app once this update comes out and try out some of these features. But it, to me, a lot of these features are already inside of Google Photos. So some of the things they were showing is like just more. Well, I don't. I guess the features are kind of already there in iOS as well. It's just a different layout. So like Caleb said, you're going to have to relearn how you use the photos app because <laughs> reasons. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Like make it look prettier. I don't know. I mean, yeah. that's something you'll have to do and report back, I yeah. guess, or listener, if you have an Apple phone, I guess, uh, or an iPhone, you'll definitely let us know. Yeah. I don't know. AirPods are also going to be getting some software updates this year. They will be getting the ability to interact with Siri via shaking or nodding your head, as well as improved noise canceling for calls in noisy environments and a spatial audio API for games. Now, that one, I actually am curious about, like because I use AirPods Pro on a very regular basis, pretty much every day. And <clears throat> there's not very often where... Like this, the time that, or the thing that I would use Siri in this way is like the way they showed it is somebody was calling and when somebody calls you and you have your AirPods in, it'll say such, you're getting a call. Do you want to answer it? And right now you have to like double tap or something like that, or you can answer it on your watch or different things like that to answer the phone. But this makes it, or you can just say yes or no, if you you know, you can do that. But this makes it so you can literally just either, if you don't want to answer it, you just shake your head. It uses the gyroscope in the headphones to know that. Or if you do want to answer it, you can nod up and down and it'll answer the phone. I actually really like that feature because I don't think I've ever just said yes or no. I don't I don't talk to my devices on a fairly regular basis. Yeah. So I, I'm interested to try that out. And then also the the better voice isolation. So like if you're in a relatively loud environment, you're on a phone call it'll basically quiet out the background noise so the person on the other end can hear you better. And for me, yep. I work in a relatively loud environment and there are times where I do call people and I use my earbuds just because I'm trying to use my hands to do other stuff while I'm talking to them on the phone. So I am very curious to try this feature out and to see if it actually does make a difference or not. So I'm looking forward to that. It's pretty cool. No, I, I I obviously I don't have the AirPods, but I, that feature of nodding your head yes or no, I was like, dang, that's actually a pretty cool feature. I mean, for all intents and purposes. Yeah, like the way they showed it off in the keynote was somebody was in a very crowded elevator and it said, Gam Gam is calling. Do you want to answer? And he looks around, shakes his head because he doesn't want to talk <laughs> on the phone with all those people around. Yeah, it was pretty funny. It is cool. TVOS is going to be adding an easier way to identify the actors or songs and whatever you happen to be watching, as well as uh, a dialogue enhancement feature. Don't use that. Just get better speakers and tune them properly. Apple TV will soon support 21 by 9 aspect ratio output, and they've added a bunch more screensavers. Is, is that it? No game mode for TV? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, Caleb. No game mode for TV. He's holding on to that. Yeah, I do love the feature that you can automate, like you can just look up actors and 
actresses and and even music that's playing on the show that you're watching. Mm-hmm. Now the way this works on app, like if you're on an Apple TV device, you just swipe. I can't remember what they said, either up or down on the remote, and it'll pop up all the people that are on screen at the time. And you can select those people. It'll show a little side menu of different things about them or the music. You can add the music to a playlist inside of Apple Music if you use that. Or if you're on, if you're watching with other people, you can also do this on the Apple TV remote on your phone. So you don't have to put it up on the main screen that you're watching the show on. You can just do it on your phone. Also yeah. pretty cool. And I, I don't have an Apple TV, so I won't really be able to utilize this. I don't think it's going to be inside of the Apple TV app. but like there are so many times where I'm watching a, a TV show or a movie. I'm like, I swear I've seen this actor in something else. And I'll have to go to IMDb true. and look up that person. And then I'll scroll through and then I'm like, Oh yeah, that's where I've seen them or, you know, things like that. So I actually think this feature is really cool. Again, I don't know if I would utilize it on the main screen very often, but the ability to do it on your phone as well is pretty cool. So I, I like that feature. I just, I, again, I probably won't be able to utilize it because I don't have an Apple TV, but I like that they're making it easier to do that for those that do have an Apple TV. Yeah, yeah, no, it it, it is cool. I I like that. Also, like in reverse of that, you know, if if like you're liking a show and you like the actor, yeah, you'd be like, oh, what else is this? I don't know who this is. I know discovering an actor. I want to see what else he or she does. You know, yeah. So, I I also like that idea. Watch OS. It's also a thing. Apple makes, they talked about it. This year, watchOS is adding transformative workout tools that'll transform how you work out and help you transform yourself. None of which I paid any attention to. Sorry, Landon. (laughs) Honestly, to be fair, so I did, I knew Caleb wouldn't pay attention to the Apple Watch stuff because he never does. He doesn't, he just doesn't care. He doesn't have an Apple Watch. I'm just glad he calls it out and let you know. I know, that was funny. Uh, But, Honestly, listener, to be fair, I did pay somewhat attention to the Apple Watch stuff. And for me, there just wasn't like it wasn't nearly as big of an update as Apple Watch OS was last year. Like all the biking stuff and the, like like that stuff that I would use. I, I go on. I, I ride a bike on a fairly regular basis. I like that stuff. And then like they also added different cycle tracking. Like there was a lot of different stuff in last year's update. This one. It's kind of a minor update. There's just basically it they're giving it more abilities to track different trends of how you're working out, how much effort you're putting in. You can you can um go into the in the set into the health app on either on your watch or on your phone and you can say, Okay, I just did this workout. It was this it was like a moderate workout for me or a hard workout for me, or you know, easy. Like there's different like one to ten, you can give it a, a rating, and then it can track Okay, this was this type of workout was a moderate one for you, but then down the road, if you're doing another workout, it'll automatically just get, okay. This was a, obviously a heavier workout, so we're gonna give it a more like a harder time frame, and then you it'll track different workouts that you've done, and you can say, okay, I'm a, I'm either getting better or I'm starting to do easier and easier workouts, and it'll give you that trend, so you can kind of more utilize how how consistent you're being or if you want to step it up you can start to step it up a little bit it's actually kind of a cool feature but again i don't think that i will utilize it so much just because i mean i i probably should work out more often but i i don't (laughs) like i said i liked the bike stuff that they added last year that was kind of cool but this stuff it, it i mean it's probably one of the things that eventually i will start to use just because it'll automatically start tracking this information and then i just have to look at it which is kind of handy. I do like that feature on the watch. It's just one of those that I'm not going to go out of my way to use it at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, it seemed, it seemed prettier, prettier. And, <laughs> you know, on there, I, I guess I also, I'm on the other side of the fence, you know, I'm, I'm with Google and they, I've been actually with Fitbit, but Google bought Fitbit. And so they're, so of course I got the Google Pixel and it's a lot of that same idea yeah. that they're trying to push for and so I mean but it is it's prettier, definitely. Yeah. And honestly, I think I'm more interested to see what happens with the actual Apple Watch this next year because this will be the tenth iteration of the Apple Watch. So everyone's expecting some sort of 
bigger update hardware wise. I don't know if that means changes to what comes with the software with this newer version that they didn't announce today, but I'm definitely more curious about that in September when they announced the iPhone and Apple watch, you know, with that version of the watch, what's going to be different there. And they may be holding back because there are certain things that they can't do on current hardware that they will be able to do with the newer app watch. I don't know. That's just me speculating. So don't hold your breath on that because you never know. But I'm (laughs) I'm more curious about that than I am with what they announced today for the watch. Now, moving on to iPad OS, iPad OS 18 is going to be adding the same basic features as you get in iOS from the home screen and control center to messages and mail iPadOS will also be adding a floating tab bar to productivity apps that is basically just the menu bar at the top of the screen in macOS. Once again, just bringing things to the iPad that are going to make it better for productivity use cases, but not in any significant way. They're also adding a calculator, complete with an appropriately tongue-in-cheek introduction, that includes a bunch of also appropriately math-focused features that I frankly didn't really understand. (laughs) He did mention the tongue-in-cheek introduction to the calculator app because, surprisingly, there's not been a calculator app on the iPad until now. Why? (laughs) Nobody knows. Everyone's been asking. It's like, Apple, why? Why haven't? Why? Why? (laughs) Like, yes, you can download third-party calculators for the iPad, and they work great. And most people, if they wanted a calculator on the iPad, did that. But now it's just built in. But there are some cool features specifically for the iPad in the calculator app, where if you have an Apple Pencil, you can write out your equation, hit the equal sign, and then it'll automatically just calculate it for you into your handwriting. And that was kind of cool. And then you can like change the parameters of that equation as you go along, and it'll change your answer. And it, it I actually really liked some of the stuff. This would definitely be more f- used, like, I think more beneficial for those that are in school, like say you're in a college class, you're taking notes in a math class or something and you just write down different things and then it can help you with that. And I thought, I I thought it was pretty cool. I did did too. I I thought it would be because you can, like I said, use the, the, the pen and scratch it out in your, in your own uh, scratch. And it would actually, do it in real time. So like, yeah. you know, two plus two equals, and then it would actually say four. And then if you change the equation, it would just update, which is cool. And then, and then we were talking a little bit before that, that how nice it makes your penmanship yeah. <laughs> for you, which uh, we were saying that I have terrible penmanship, but guess what? So, so does Landon. Yes. <laughs> iPad will also be getting improved handwriting features with SmartScript, which will not only let you handwrite notes with all of the existing benefits that are currently there, but now it makes your handwriting legible as you go. I'll bet good money it won't work on my handwriting, which is a shame because it also adds the ability to spell check your handwritten stuff. And this is what Wes was just saying. Yeah, and I was. We all agreed. Like, I, I don't know if this would work on my handwriting because my handwriting is awful. So I, I wish I could test this out, but I don't have an iPad that's new enough to be able to utilize this or an Apple Pencil. So I I can't try it out, but I want to. <laughs> I might yeah. have to go into a store somewhere that has a newer iPad with an Apple Pencil <laughs> that I can try out and just yeah, start writing just and see, play if with it, this feature. see if it understands <laughs> what I'm saying and it can, you know, make it nice and legible and people can actually read my handwriting. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Now, moving on to macOS. This year, macOS is going to be getting this Sequoia moniker, which I like. Sequoias are cool. macOS will be adding all of the messages, calculator, mail, and map stuff from iOS and iPadOS. A significant update to continuity is going to add iPhone mirroring, allowing you to view and control your iPhone wirelessly from your Mac. The phone remains locked or in whatever state it was in before, and honestly, this looks kind of amazing assuming it works as advertised. This one I'm actually really also curious on because like the way they showcased it is like the phone was in a completely different area. Like, like they said, maybe your phone is like in your backpack somewhere and you're in your office or what. It's like, it can be somewhere else and you can basically just pull up your phone on the screen 
and then do everything you normally would. Like they were showing it on a laptop so you can use the trackpad to scroll like you normally would on the screen and different things like that. It was really cool. But then also it was using continuity to like drag and drop things from the phone to your computer or vice versa. So like the way he showed it was like there was a video he wanted to put into a note that was on his phone. So he, the video was on his desktop. He exported the video and then just drag and dropped it onto the note and then it put the video inside the note on his phone. And that was really cool. I I don't know. I mean, I don't know how often I would fully utilize this, but I do like the ability to do that. And the other, the other way they showed it, it was like if you have your phone charging and you have it in landscape mode, it shows the – I can't remember what they call it, but it has like a little clock display in, on there and stuff when it's charging. And yeah. it kept it in that mode, but then you could do everything else on, on your quote-unquote phone on your Mac – and without changing anything on the physical device of your phone, it was, I really liked it. Yeah, it was, it was very flawless. It, you know, portrayed the way it was being portrayed. It was pretty cool seeing that too. So like, like you said, hopefully it's as good as they show it. Yeah. <laughs> also, holy crap, they're adding window snapping. We're only what a decade late on that feature. 15 years. It's a lot. <laughs> Keychain is going to become a dedicated password app instead of a collection of haphazard integrated features across all of their operating systems so that it'll work more consistently like other password management apps you might be familiar with. This feature I'm also really excited for because I was telling Wes beforehand, I use Bitwarden as my main default password manager app, and I love the fact that it is an app, but I also use iOS like I or Apple Keychain for passwords on my iOS de- or on my Apple devices. But I also use Google passwords for other things because I use Google for a lot of years. So I have passwords all over the place. And I mean, they do, I do usually save all my passwords to all these locations. So, yeah. you know, but I love the fact that it is a dedicated app like Bitwarden. So I can, it's just easier to manage those things. Like inside of Google, it's a little more of a pain. I have to go into Chrome either on my computer or on my phone and then go through and manage passwords that way. Or as as it is right now in iOS, I have to go into the settings app, show down the passwords and stuff. But having a dedicated app for that, both on my phone and on my computer, will make it a whole lot easier to be able to change those, like edit those passwords or just, you know, go in and manage different things inside of the passwords app. And I, I really like that they're breaking this out into its own separate thing. It'll just be a whole lot less convoluted and a lot easier to use. Yeah, I I agree with that. It, same how I use it. I except I I use uh I use my my Microsoft account with yeah. passwords. That's my secondary. So yeah, I I get what you're saying. And this is really really good for people that use the Apple um their pass keys and all that stuff for yeah. data. So yeah, absolutely. Apple also says they're improving game support, and Baldur's Gate three is coming to Mac this year. But honestly. I'm still not seeing enough adoption for this to feel like developers are buying in. Apple, you need to bankroll some games. Uh, yeah. This, I mean, (laughs) let's see, what's the, uh, Stadia. Mm. You gotta bankroll games. Yeah. Perfect example. If if they want this to take off, I, I don't know, like, because they continue, it's it's funny because they continue to talk about, look, you can do this game here and these previous games on here, but it's, there's not such a big thing on it. And I think, but they, but they keep telling, I don't know if they're thinking, oh, we're Apple. Everyone will just come flocking. I don't know. I, I just like, like Caleb said, you've got to bankroll these things and yeah, expect to lose. I don't know. They expect to lose money at the beginning, but you know, so I, I agree with Caleb on that, but I mean, Baldur's Gate three, I, I haven't played it, but I hear it's really good. Yeah. So, and I, Apple has been trying to push gaming on the Mac for a few years, like probably five or six years, pretty heavily at this point. And well, a lot more than they used to. Yes, like, definitely a lot definitely more than they used to. But more. they've been, it's been like a major part of the keynote. Like they had somebody from Ubisoft come out and talk, like they were on stage for probably five minutes talking mm-hmm. about different stuff that they're doing to use Mac OS and whatnot, which is good. And they've done that in the past. But again, like Caleb said, developers aren't just throwing themselves at 
making sure their games work on Mac OS because the community is still not there for that yet. I do think it will eventually happen. And I'd like that Apple is still trying to make it happen because if they don't continue to try, it never will happen. IE Stadia, they kind of stopped. And so obviously it's not going to happen, but yeah, I do like that. They're doing this. They also did mention how they're making it easier for developers. What if they develop a game for Mac OS, they can more easily port these games to work on iPad OS or iOS. So they don't really have to change much of anything, if anything, to their games to just work across all of Apple's devices, which is also great because then you're going to get full-fledged high-end games on your iPad or on your phone. And I and the developer doesn't have to do a whole lot of anything else to make it work. Like Obviously, there's going to be some tweaks and stuff, but mm-hmm. Apple's making it easier for these developers to do that. And getting your game in more locations is in general a good thing. It's mm-hmm. just at the time trying to find the audience in those locations is kind of hit or miss. Got to make a big old deal uh, with Microsoft to be able to do something with game pass. Just be like, Hey, you make a game, you subscribe to game pass. These games, certain games, obviously be more over to, you can put it over to uh, Mac or something kind of interesting or yeah. PlayStation or whoever. Like, right. To bring it over stuff that's there to, I don't know, because if they're wanting this gaming thing to push forward, you might have to partner with someone or, like Caleb said, really put some money into it. <laughs> I, yeah, I think between putting money towards things and actually partnering with a game developer to have a game launch, either either have it launch exclusively at first on macOS or have it launch with everything as I well know, as macOS, yeah. because... That's kind of the thing. Like a lot of the games that they've brought to Mac OS the past few years and the showcase to these conferences have been games that have already been out for a year or two. Like, I mean, Baldur's Gate 3, it's been out for a while, but now it's coming to Mac. It's like, well, why didn't you work with these people beforehand to get it to launch on Mac? You know, I think doing things like that is going to be more beneficial because then people is like, oh, I've already played that game here. So why would I just bring it over here, you know, it doesn't make sense for most gamers. It's like, oh, this game's already on my Mac and I haven't played it yet. Okay, I'll download it there instead. So I think doing that's going to be beneficial. If if you had an option to game, because you don't have a gaming system, really, no. would you take that on uh, your Mac? I mean, I honestly, mean, would you try anything? I mean, me personally, probably not, just because I, yeah. it's not my thing, but I know enough people that their main computer is going to be a Mac, but they have a console or a gaming PC to play games that yeah. might try. I mean, I don't know if Caleb would. He's the one more like more like to ask about this because again, he is that person that his main computer is a Mac, but he has a PC to game on. So it's like he could be in that crowd of depending on if the game launches on Mac OS, you know, that's again, that's my thing. You need to launch the game in the location. You want people to play it, not just hope that they haven't played it already. And like, Oh, I didn't play that <laughs> game because it wasn't on Mac OS. No, nobody's doing that. Yeah. We'd have to see like, well, but like you said, money, put the money into yes. it if you want it. Definitely. Now, moving on to a collection of features that span their operating systems. Apple is also adding a bunch of AI features to their systems, and they're calling it AI, which in this case means Apple intelligence, because, I mean, let's be honest, of course it does. You'd be somehow disappointed if it didn't. That doesn't mean you can't feel even more disappointed that this is the timeline we live in, though. (laughs) So true. Of course (laughs) it's Apple intelligence. I, uh, yep. I mean. I, I was telling, I was telling Landon before I was like, when we were before we started recording, I was like, Apple intelligence. When I first heard, it, I was just like, man, they are just so up themselves <laughs> to call it that. But I'm like, yeah, I guess that's Apple, man. Yeah, I mean, I don't. As they kept going along with that name, I don't, I don't hate it. It's not a bad name. I don't think this is going to be one of those that's up for worst tech name of the year or something like that. I do think it's not a, it's not a bad name. It's just. Like Caleb said, 
of course they're going to name it their own thing. And it's yeah. going, I mean, it's AI, Apple Intelligence. It just works, you know? Uh, it's just kind of like, uh, duh. Why Why wouldn't they do that? It True. But th- does that qualify to be one of the bad names on our yearly list here? Apple Intelligence? See, I, tech name. I personally I don't, don't think so. I think, like I said, I think it's fine, but. You think it's okay? Yeah, I do. I mean, it. Yeah, I, I'd have to agree. I, I think it's okay. It works. I just, I don't know. The way I took it, I was like, really? <laughs> In the beginning, I was like, all right. But did I expect anything less? No. Yeah, no. Apple Intelligence is basically just an LLM that lives in the background of all of their apps doing stuff like collating your notes and websites to give you summaries, customizing and generating content for your messages, or boosting the effectiveness of Siri. It's exactly what you've seen happening in Bing or Google based on the identified integration with ChatGPT. I would guess that the LLM on the back end is in fact just GPT-4, but I will grant that they do seem to be mostly doing a better job of security stuff, processing things mostly on device and using their own encrypted servers for cloud models. So I they didn't I didn't hear them well, okay, they didn't actually say that this like all these little features that they're adding to iOS and macOS and all this stuff was using they didn't say what the back end of it was. Now they did mention at the end that they have partnered with ChatGPT to do other stuff on top of this "quote unquote" Apple intelligence, and they also said that they will their plan. They have plans to partner with other third party. They didn't mention names, but obviously like Gemini and different mm-hmm. companies like that that are working on this stuff. That like so, if you're asking Siri, it's a lot of this stuff was Siri's a lot smarter now and more. In, you know, like the Apple intelligence is built into Siri. And it's it, it reminded me a lot of what Android is or what Google is doing inside of Android, where it's like you can do anything, use the AI stuff in any app on your screen, like and it'll do it all on device. Like I said, like what Android is doing, and I like that. But they didn't mention any back end, like what the back end LLM was that was powering all this. But they did mention in the other at the end of it that if you want to. You can utilize on top of this chat GPT to do extra stuff. And and it also asks you, like, if you're using Siri, it asks permission before you switch. So it's like, do you want me to use GPT to find this out for you? And it can do that. And then if you want to send a photo to it, it will be like, do you want me to send this photo to chat GPT? And it can do that. So the way I looked at it is it's using chat GPT as a third party type AI on top of what Apple is doing. Now, again, they didn't, I don't, I don't know of anything that I haven't seen anything anywhere that's saying that chat GPT is the back end of this. I'm not saying that it's not. I just don't know for sure that it is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. At, so, at least how you explained it to me. <laughs> how so, you said, yeah. Yeah. So that's how, that's what I got out of this. Now, again, like Caleb said, we don't, they didn't mention it. I don't know. That it's like I said, I don't know that it's not ChatGPT, but the way they made it sound like because they're also planning on partnering with other AI developers, that you could basically set up as your default outside of the device uh, in AI service. So like you could use Gemini down the road or ChatGPT right now or whatever. So yeah. I I I'm sure more details about that will come out in the coming weeks. But as of right now, I don't know for sure that they are using ChatGPT as the back end of Apple intelligence, as they call it. Right. It's more giving you the option if you want to. Right. Honestly, I don't see these features making a big impact in people's lives. But at the very least, Apple seems to be aware of that. They spend a lot of time on this, but the features they introduced, they kind of pointed them out as minor improvements that will simplify a few interactions and enable a couple of fun moments. This, however, doesn't actually represent solutions to actual problems, seemingly confirming that, yeah, I was generally right about AI being a solution in search of a problem. And for the most part, that's kind of my takeaway from the whole event. Apple is making minor improvements and adding small, little, nice-to-have features to their platforms across the board that don't make any big swings. 
These updates are the dictionary definition of iterative, and for the most part, that's okay. But it does kind of suggest that both the Vision Pro and AI features exist in this limbo technological solutions to problems that, honestly, nobody seems to be able to articulate. I don't mind iterative updates. What does bother me is that all this time, all this developer time, all of this development money Apple spends has been spent trying to generate solutions to problems that aren't problems instead of fixing actual basic issues, like redesigning the fetching settings app in Mac OS. <laughs> and that's the end of Caleb's thing about WWDC for 2024. Um, I do mostly agree with what he said about the AI stuff. I do think they are adding some like a lot of the stuff they're adding is basically just being able to do certain things faster. Like I said, it's very similar to what Google is doing inside of Android and across their different services. It's just yeah. making it so you can you do certain things a little bit quicker. There are going to be those things that, yes, that's a cool feature, but how many people are actually going to use it? I don't know. Like the writing suggestions or like you can, if you're sending an email to a, a coworker, you can have it change. Like you can write it all out. And then you can use AI to change the way it sounds. Like if you want to sound more professional or more concise or, you know, different things like that, you can do that and it'll tweak what you wrote. It won't change what you wrote, but just tweak it to make it sound a different mood, I guess. Yeah. Like how often are people going to use that? I don't know. But they did also add the ability to, you know, magic eraser inside of the photos app. They called it something else, but. The ability to yeah. delete something out of the background and it fills in the empty space for you. Finally, great option. I love it. Those are the those type of features to me are things that will get utilized. Again, like Caleb said, a lot of these things are n not solving any major problems, but some of these little things, like the photos thing, are extremely beneficial. Again, not really solving a problem, but a nice feature to have. So. Yes, I, I I don't think that any of the AI stuff right now is game changing in any way, shape, or form to anybody, or at least to most to ninety percent of the people in the in the world. But they are nice features when you need them, in my yes. opinion. I I would agree. I would agree with you on that. I you know, I I think I've mentioned on the podcast, you know, I don't use a lot of the features. <laughs> right like that that they keep iterating on and so it, it is nice it is cool um once you start using those those things you know but like caleb said there's just it's a solution without a problem at the moment yeah with, with all of it but but hey that's wwdc <laughs> yeah <laughs> everything there and apple intelligence and everything uh i did think it, it reminded me when we, we were talking about the readjusting your apps on the iPhone, readjusting your apps and everything. Um, when I was watching it, I, I did remember, I was like, huh, that was a Windows phone feature. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wow, it's nice to see that that's come back full circle on that. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> thought that was funny. But... Well, that's the event, dear listener. Um, that <laughs> a lot of, a lot of interesting things. Um, if you have any comments you want us to look at, or if you want to say anything on that, you can uh, let us know on social media and stuff. But uh, that's everything. I think we're going to go ahead and end the episode there. We weren't going to talk about anything else. Um, just the event for this episode next week. We will be talking more on everything gaming, which I'm sure you've probably heard or seen something about, listener, because there's some big hitters that's happened. There's some some hardware talks and things like that. So, and there's still more to come this week. So that's kind of how we usually do it on this podcast is <laughs> the the week that everything's coming out for gaming uh, of the WWDC. We usually do the WWDC first and then we gaming the week after when all the gaming news is all wrapped up. So, and that's how we'll do it for next week. So, Unless Landon, do you have one more thing for us? No, no, I don't. <laughs> okay. Well, listener, like I said before, if you want to get a hold of us or have any comments or anything, you can on our social media platforms. Uh, also on our website at callingallplatforms.com. 
You can take a look at our YouTube, uh, your YouTube channel there. Uh, maybe Caleb might update it with something. Who knows? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> oh, there, I give him a hard time for that. Um, all right, dear listener, have a good week. Bye bye. See ya. Calling All Platforms is a production of Supporter Sound Studios. To learn more about how you can support the podcast, go to www.patreon.com slash callingallplatforms.